Welcome to ICN Sunday Morning. I'm Vernon Loeb, Executive Editor. In a world that's warming dangerously, the first thing we encounter is increased heat. A 2021 study in the scientific journal Nature Climate Change found that 37% of warm season heat-related deaths can be attributed to climate change and that increased mortality is evident on every continent. We're familiar with heat stroke when the body's core temperature rises to 104 degrees or higher. This can cause rapid and serious damage to the brain, heart, kidneys, muscles, and other organs. But there's still so much that medical researchers don't understand about the way high heat affects human, plant, and animal health. Joining me this morning is Liza Gross, who lives in the Bay Area outside Berkeley, California, and writes brilliantly for us about a lot of things, including health and science. She recently looked at how rising temperatures can affect the risks and spread of infectious diseases by altering the biology and behavior of pathogens and their hosts, from butterflies to people. Liza, thanks so much for joining me. Happy to be here. In this story, you wrote about new research at Trinity College, Dublin, in Ireland. Can you summarize the findings for us? Yeah, the major take home from this study is that heat waves can dramatically alter a parasite's ability to reproduce and cause disease, but it's complicated. The researchers used a classic laboratory model for studying infectious diseases. It's called the Daphnia or or a spora model. And so Daphne are these water fleas that live at the base of the food chain and play critical roles in freshwater ecosystems. And these their parasites infect their guts. And so the research involved a series of very carefully designed experiments where scientists exposed the fleas to heat waves under different conditions, using infected fleas and then uninfected fleas as controls. And they chose several different baseline temperatures. So they added heat um, spikes at different points to sort of simulate what might happen in the environment. And then they sort of changed the intensity and the duration of the heat exposure at different times to when the fleas were infected and also using uninfected fleas as a control. But basically what they found was that heat spikes delivered at a lower baseline increased the parasites numbers by about two and a half times. But in the most intensive treatments, so basically starting at a high baseline and then hitting, giving them like a simulated heat wave, it actually decreased the parasite numbers. So basically it's complicated, which is kind of like the bottom line for all biology. But what it sort of says to me, and it also says it's hard to predict how this is going to happen because there's so many variables at play. But one thing that really sort of stood out for me is it's possible that as heat waves sort of hit places unaccustomed to extreme heat, you might see spikes in disease. And so we might also see more cases of tropical diseases in pla like malaria and Zika in places like the southeastern uh, United States, where we don't really see those diseases because it's getting warmer and now the vectors and their parasites can live there. So extreme heat's not just affecting us, but it's affecting everything we come in contact with. That's absolutely true, yes. yes. One of the examples you use is that um, elevated temperatures in the oceans reduce the abilities of the ability of coral reefs to fight off infections and it also uh, this warming ocean also uh, strengthens the vir virulence of their pathogens um, so what should humans be taking from this research you're writing about well, I think the first thing is that we should care about the fact that corals, we've used our, our use of fossil fuels has really stressed out the ocean um, environment for the all the creatures that live there. I mean, we basically, uh, this unprecedented rise in sea surface temperatures has, uh, has decimated coral reef ecosystems around the world. But in general, um, scientists have seen that exposure to high heat triggers changes in the immune system. And so that makes, you know, even us more susceptible to infection and just a few things. I mean, there's evidence um, in humans that high heat might interfere with our immune cells. So the immune cells that are able to recognize viruses or bacteria or other pathogens, and that makes our bodies unable to fight those pathogens. So 
if heat is giving pathogens an advantage by allowing them to proliferate faster or expand to new ranges where they can infect people who never saw that pathogen before, that's bad news. And that's actually what happened with COVID. So it was a novel virus that our bodies hadn't seen before. We didn't have antibodies to sort of protect ourselves, to recognize the virus and then fight it. And we didn't have vaccines um, to prevent the disease at that in the beginning of the pandemic, which is why millions have so far died. One of the things that struck me reading your story was um, beyond everything that researchers are learning about heat, how much we still don't know about heat. Um, does that ever strike you as you're, as you're delving these, um, this sort of deep research into heat? Yeah. It's I mean, sort I of a mystery. It is. I mean, and I think that's a general anytime you're dealing with biology, because it's really difficult to understand how organisms are going to respond when you to any environmental change. I mean, heat uh, especially. And so it sort of depends on the context, which in the case of this study means like what the temperature is when the heat wave hits, how long it lasts, when you if you're like dealing with infectious disease, when are you infected? Um, all these things uh, affect the outcome. And so that means that research like this really suggests that we need to be doing a lot more research looking at other host pathogen interactions that, you know, not just in relation to human diseases, but in relation to maintaining healthy ecosystems and also, you know, we're looking at important agricultural crops. And I just want to say another question that the new study raises is sort of whether pathogens are going to be able to adapt to heat better than we can and other hosts. And that's a really important question because basically they're, they have a much faster uh, lifespan, <laughs> like they can reproduce a lot faster than we can, which means they can pick up genetic changes to adapt to heat a lot faster than we can. And so we really, uh, scientists really need to be doing these kind of evolutionary studies. But right now, the administration, the Trump administration has pretty much eviscerated funding, federal funding um, grants for infectious disease, which is not good. Yeah. One of your mini beats there in California is um, migrant farm workers. Um, you've written really powerfully about them and their work. Um, I'm wondering what sort of um, climate change related health effects are they suffering? Well, I, I'll say first that extreme heat is the number one weather-related killer in the United States, and outdoor workers who engage in strenuous physical activity, like farm workers and construction workers, are particularly vulnerable. And I, I would say that um, especially migrant farm workers um, are even more vulnerable because so many are undocumented, and they're afraid of bringing attention to themselves if they need help. And so one thing that we discovered in our reporting is that um, deaths from heat stress are notoriously undercounted. Um, in a big study, we in a big investigation we did, we saw that California OSHA rep reported that just two California farm workers died from heat exposure between 2018 and 2022. But because heat stress is often misclassified by both doctors and then um, physicians who do, you know, evaluate uh, bodies for death certificates. Um, it's often misclassified. So they, this is because he can cause a number of other conditions like heart attacks and strokes and can even cause fatal accidents because people get disoriented or dizzy and then, you know, some, some, somehow, you know, get into an accident that kills them. And so these things are not accounted for. But scientists um, also know, and this is something we looked at in our investigation, that air pollution, which is a major killer in its own right, is causing a really uh, interacts with heat in a particularly deadly way. And so we decided to look at OSHA records to see when farm workers were dying in relation to how hot it was and whether they were working in polluted air. And instead of finding two farm workers who died during that period, which OSHA had um, reported, we found 83 people had died. And so it's really important also to note that farm workers are wearing like heavy clothing to protect themselves from pesticides when they're working. So that increases their sort of, you know, core body temperature even more. And we know that extreme heat events are beginning, becoming more common with climate change. 
So they're going to be more frequent, they're going to be more intense. And so we experts are expecting um, more heat deaths in the future, especially among such um, vulnerable populations as farm workers. Do you think the state of California is doing enough to protect their health? Well, I'd have to say no, because everybody I speak to, all the experts say that heat uh, heat illness is totally preventable and no one should die from exposure to heat. Yet, um, even last year, we saw heat deaths in California. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you've also written recently about how um, President Trump, uh, on coming back to office, immediately froze a rule that um, the Biden administration, OSHA, had sort of rushed to put in place to protect um, the health of outdoor workers. Um, it's, a, it's a rule that would have guaranteed them uh, adequate water and shade and rest once temperatures reached a certain point, no matter where they worked, be it you know Maine or Florida. And, and now this rule is on hold. Um, What's that? What's the state of the national debate now about uh, protections for workers as it gets hotter and hotter um, because of the climate? Well, I could say that there's a hearing on the, the federal heat roll um, that Biden proposed toward the end of the administration coming up in a couple of weeks. And the occupational health experts I speak to are not very hopeful about it um, getting through as long as uh, Trump is in office. And so a little sense of the debate is that earlier this month, Republicans in the um, House Workforce Protections Committee called a hearing um, on the standard and they made it very clear that their, per their uh, perception of the standard is that it's regulatory overreach. And then they, the GOP led committee uh, called re representatives from industry, including the construction industry, which has a very high death rate in, of uh, workers from heat. Obviously they're working in very dangerous con conditions that you know, are up in scaffolding and all sorts of other things. And so they basically were um, objecting to the heat roll as a one size fits all regulation, which is not true though, because basically what, what the heat roll does is it sets a what's called a heat index. So when the temperature reaches a certain level with a certain amount of humidity, then these rules kick in. And that's not one size fits all, that's just when we're at risk of heat exposure. Um, and so extreme heat is the most dangerous, I will also say the first few days of when somebody's on the job because they don't have a chance to get uh, acclimated and so to the, to the heat. And so these rules, um, basically they just say, you need to train people to recognize these symptoms, you know, your coworkers and your supervisors. And you also need to take these basic pr protections as you recommended, heat, water, rest, shade, very simple things which save lives. And so in the absence of these federal rules, which have been very long, long in the making. And, uh, you know, I mean, the there were the um, NIOSH, which provides standards, science-based standards for OSHA, for regulations, said in the 1970s that we need, right, we need a heat roll to protect workers. And so finally, like last year, they sort of finally got around to it. But um, in the absence of these federal rules, states, including California, have come, come through with rules, but they're still not in like the Southwest or the Southeastern states, which are gonna see some of the worst effects of high heat, extreme heat. Yeah, I think Florida expressly prohibited such protections. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Okay, one last question. What's the single most important thing people can do this summer to protect themselves against high heat and prolonged high heat? Well, I'm not sure there's a single thing to do. I mean, I know that you should definitely avoid strenuous activity if you can, or if you have to do it, do it in the morning or in the evening when it's a little bit cooler. And then just what workers do, you know, make sure you're, you're getting plenty of water, take some rests and um, yeah, just d don't overdo it. Liza, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you so much for this. It was great to talk about this important topic. Thanks, Vernon. Sure. And thanks to all of you for reading and for supporting our work at Inside Climate News.